Hi, I'm Brent Wilson. I'm the director, co-writer, and co-producer of Brian Wilson, Long Promise Road. Brian just threw away the rule book, just took you out of where you were and took you to another place. There was no greater world created in rock and roll than the Beach Boys. The level of musicianship, I don't think anybody's touched it yet. To dream up these textures that never existed before. That's why people say Brian's a genius. You know, the rooftop is down. The story begins. I'm picking up. The beauty of it carries with it a sense of joyfulness, even in the pain of living. You know there's something going on with Brian Wilson. There's no hiding that this man is troubled, trying to escape something. And the pressure that comes with that, you know, the, the pressure to continue to be the person that people think you are supposed to be. The idea of doing an interview makes Brian nervous. And this is kind of where things got difficult for you, huh? Yeah. What was going on? I don't know. I was having mental problems. Yeah, yeah. So we'll often ask if we can just take a drive and listen to some music. So this was all where the house was, right here? Yeah. We can I don't get, out. get out. I just want to look. Okay. There it is. Look. There it is. <laughs> just marks the spot. <laughs> the fact that he's still here and making music, it's a miracle kind of, isn't it? I don't know how you do that. One, two, three. Yeah, we're cool. I got this terrible feeling in my chest, you know? I'm nervous. You got this. That must have been a really exciting time. It was. It was a trip. This is Factual America. We're brought to you by Alamo Pictures, an Austin and London-based production company making documentaries about America for international audiences. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week I watch a hit documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. This week it is my pleasure to welcome back award-winning documentary filmmaker Brent Wilson, the director, co-producer, and writer of Brian Wilson, Long Promised Road. Brian Wilson was the co-founder of the seminal 60s rock group The Beach Boys. As the leader and creative genius behind the band's many hits, Brian Wilson has influenced generations of pop stars. But don't take my word for it. Watch the interviews with Bruce Springsteen, Elton John, Taylor Hawkins, and other pop royalty. But what makes this film special are the moments Brent has captured with Brian Wilson and Rolling Stone journalist Jason Fine, as they go on a journey, both literal and figurative, through Brian's old stomping grounds and memories which include over a half a century of battling mental illness. Stay tuned and learn how Brent was able to bring a new angle to a rock legend, all the while exploring what it means to be human. Brent, welcome back to Factual America. How have things been with you? Have you uh, had a good pandemic? <laughs> Thank you, Matthew. It's really great to be back. I, uh, I'm a big fan of you guys' program. I've... Uh, I think I've heard them all since our uh, oh, no. our last interview. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan, so it's well, it's it's great to be back. Thank you very much. Well, that's amazing. That's we we'll appreciate the feedback. I think you and my mom are the only ones, but that's uh, that's great. Um, and you and R.J. Cutler are the only repeat guests so far, so that puts R.J. in rarefied company indeed, doesn't it? I, I'll take that very much so. Absolutely, <laughs> R.J. is an incredible filmmaker, and I did. I I remember the one that you guys did on Belushi, and it was uh, it was excellent. Yeah, yeah, it was excellent. Interestingly, as I, I thought of Belushi a few times watching your film, um, which is, uh, for our listeners, uh, Brent's, uh, well, you it's uh, the film's Brian Wilson, Long Promised Road, came out last year, premiered at Tribeca, uh, Grand Jury Prize winner at Nashville Film Festival. Uh, so you had the theatrical release in the U.S. in November, I guess, and in January here in the U.K. and probably worldwide. And I gather it's on demand on various streaming services. So congratulations. What a great film. You must be so pleased at how this has all turned out. We did talk about it briefly last time around. We did. We did because it uh, the film kind of came out of Street Life Harmonies a little bit. The film that we were talking about was kind of born in that. And no, we are. We're 
after uh, <clears throat> after such a long journey and uh, a, a difficult film to make and um, mm. um, a passion project for sure, as all documentaries really are. Actually, they're all kind of all passion projects, but yeah. this one in particular, you know, I, I just put my heart and soul into, and so it's uh, it's it's really rewarding to to see it being received well and uh, to have its theatrical release and uh, and to be seen and, and received uh, internationally. So yeah, it's. It's been a long promise road on this end, and it's, uh, <laughs> it's lovely to finally uh, to have it, have it out there and be seen. Well, if you're listening to your our episodes uh, on a regular basis, you know what the first question's going to be, I think. Um, it's tried and true, but it gets us started. So let, for audience, so what is Brian Wilson, Long Promise Road, really all about? Give us a bit of a synopsis of the film. Absolutely. This is a, a very different, and uh, I, I would say intimate and very personal look into the life of Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. And uh, Brian Wilson, as most people know, even if they're not familiar with his background, know that he's lived a very enigmatic life and a very traumatic life. And even if they know only the biggest hits, Surfing USA, California Girls, Good Vibrations, know that he's made some remarkable music but equal to his music has been his life and, um, and his story. And um, this film is a really personal journey into Brian's life um, with an unusual approach that we, they we ended up taking, trying to, to try to separate Brian the myth and Brian the legend from Brian the person and Brian the man. Yeah, I think, uh, well, exactly. And I'm glad you put it that way because... Uh, You've had great reviews, although obviously, like anything, there's always those one or two <laughs> naysayers oh. who I won't mention. Uh, I won't even mention <laughs> some of the reviews. Club, by the way. <laughs> yeah, well, what's that? It's like, how do you get, like, I'll never understand how you can get just like one or two guys, you know, one or two yeah. people who just like, no, I don't get it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. There's this, there's this bio, the other biopics are a lot better. You know, it's like, yeah. uh, you know, this is like, a, you know, I, I'll, I'll say it. You can, if, for listeners, if you want to go on the Wikipedia page, because it does, you know, you don't learn anything more than you wouldn't get out of a Wikipedia article. You know, what's the, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, what, what film were they watching? Uh, is what I, what I ask. Um, I mean, not to, not to blow smoke or anything, but it was just, you know, I, I, I never look at the, I never actually look up reviews usually, but I watched it and I just kind of Googled and I was like, what? <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, um, so there's always just one, right? There's always just one or two, but we are, yeah. we're really, I'm really so, cause you know, I, I, I really took a, a risk with the way that we made the film. So I didn't know if the film was going to work, you know, critically or with fans, uh, because it is such an unusual approach. And, you know, I remember the, the night before Tribeca, you know, I told my wife, I was like, you know, I see it, I feel it, you know, I, I, I know that it's, it's working in my heart, but I, you know, I'm too close at this point. I really don't know if yeah. fans or critics are going to kind of understand what we're trying to do here. And so it was really beautifully uh, received. It, so I was so grateful that the critics and the fans have actually yeah. tapped into this different approach that we took. Well, well let, maybe let's take that even a little bit further. What were you trying, what, what, what are you trying to do here? If we just be very explicit and then also, uh, and, and what are you showing that maybe the, uh, his fans and even those who don't, aren't that familiar with him will not have seen or, or heard before. Sure. You know, uh, Brian is famously, um, anti-interview. He just hates to be interviewed. And, uh, if anybody's ever seen him on a, on a television interview show or heard him on the radio or seen a YouTube clip, you can just tell how much he hates it and, um, how uncomfortable he is. Um, and it's just impossible to get a real answer out of him mm -hmm. in, a, in a traditional interview setting. And I think, you know, part of that is, you know, He's been asked questions since he was, you know, 19 years old. You know, yeah, Brian's 80, yeah. and uh, almost he'll be 80 in June. And, you know, he's been asked, you know, he, he had his first hit at 20, I think, 20. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's, a, you know, that's 60 years of interviews. Um, he, uh, he just doesn't feel comfortable sitting down, you know, under lights and wearing a microphone. He really has an adverse reaction to wearing a microphone. Um, so it's just really hard to get an honest, deep, reflective answer out of Brian in an interview. 
And but that was my goal going in. I thought, you know, that's what I've got to try to do. That's my job as a filmmaker. Yeah. Yeah. If I can't get an answer out of this guy that opens up and reveals who he is, then I'm failing. And so that was our goal going in, yeah. was if I can just somehow, some way, have Brian reveal to the audience and to us who he is as a person, then um, then we've we've accomplished our goal. So that was the goal going in. And so uh, one thing I was going to ask you, and I'll ask it now, is uh, I guess it's no coincidence that one of these opening scenes, which I just loved, was um, you ask him. You know, he's just been on a big tour. Uh, he's in his 70s, yet he's doing more tours than he's ever done, 100 and something shows in a year or whatever. You say, how do you do it? And he just, I mean, I think literally just says, it's in my head, goes to my fingers, and it goes out the speaker. And you say, can you explain it? And he says, No. And that's it. And you, I can just picture your shoulders drooping and your head hanging. Like, how the hell am I going to make a film? <laughs> if this is was that one of the was that one of the first things you filmed with him? And it's you know that's that's why you put it up front and center, isn't it? That's exactly it, Matthew. That's exactly it. That that scene is is up front to try to just give. A, a little bit of a taste of the audience of what it's like to try to interview Brian, just in case you didn't know how difficult it was for Brian. It was like, here's just a small little <laughs> idea of what it's like. And that was actually my final attempt to interview him. Um, wow. I had tried to interview him a few other times. Um, the first time we tried to interview him, it was just audio only. And mm -hmm. um, it went really poorly. And I thought, well, it's okay. I'm nervous. He's nervous. Well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be okay. Um, I tried an interview the second time where we, we went to Capitol records and, uh, this scene's not in the film. Um, but we went to Capitol records and I put him in a piano and we surrounded him with some friends and some band members and they asked the questions and I tried that and, you know, it went a little better, a smidge better, but he just kept looking at his watch. You know, it was one of those things <laughs> like, you know, he'd answer their questions in a friendly way, but I still wasn't getting there. And then, as you said, I went the third time and, you know, what did you see at the beginning of the film? And that's in his house. That's up in his music room. You know, it's his home. So I thought, oh, he's going to feel a little more comfortable here. And that interview was 50 minutes of yes, no, no, I don't know how. <laughs> and it was like I was getting beat up by Mike Tyson. And uh, I was just like, I, this is it. My career is over. I'll never work again. You know, made a couple of nice movies and. You know, I need to sell the house. I don't know. I wonder but, if I can get it, you know, can I operate a cash register now? What do I do? I don't, you know, I have no skills. You know, <laughs> so, so, you know, what does a documentary filmmaker apply for as a job? I can't sell shoes. Yeah. You know, what am I going to do? So I thought I was done. <laughs> yeah. So how did you, so that's just, um, how did you get beyond that? Um, I mean, I, I think having seen it, I, I, I know, but uh, how did that process work? Because you, you're, you're stuck because you, you wanted to make this film. We can talk more about how that access was lined up and, and why you were making it now, but you, you're stuck here. You, you're not getting anywhere. You don't have a film on your hands. What happens next? Sure. I had, um, I, uh, after that third time where I just, just, yeah, just getting beat up, I, uh, I, I talked to Gene Sievers, Brian's manager, longtime publicist, and she had suggested that I talk to Jason Fine. Jason Fine was the editor of Rolling Stone magazine. Mm -hmm. And Jason had interviewed Brian numerous times over the last, you know, over the previous 15, 20 years or so. And they had become friends. And Gene thought that maybe um, Jason could have some advice. Mm -hmm. You know, he could give me some tips on how to interview Brian. Um, but before we did our phone call, I went back and reread uh, all of Jason's articles. And so she had set up the conference call. Before that call, I went back and read all of his articles and there was one article in particular in Rolling Stone. It was called Brian Wilson's Better Days. And in that article, Jason describes driving around L.A. and they go to the movies to see the Wrecking Crew movie. Oh, wow. Um, they go out for sushi. And they go get a massage together. Um, <laughs> and just, you know, and they're just kind of cruising around L.A. And I thought, you know what? That's a great movie. You know, Brian Wilson yeah. touring around L.A. It's his, own, it's his home. It's He's defined to this city, he, right, you know, right. he, you know, it's his vision and his dream of LA that, that yeah. helped build LA. And I mean, he's one of the cornerstones of the, of the California dream. So I thought, you know, that's the film I'd like to see. 
So we got on the phone with Jason, and uh, and Jason talked about his process, how he gets in the car with Brian, mm -hmm. and they drive around, and sometimes they'll drive for hours, and Brian doesn't say anything, um, uh, but he never pressures him, and you know sometimes you know to get a single article, it can take weeks and weeks of mm -hmm. you know of trips out here from New York to LA to to drive around with, with Brian, and um, and then at the end of the phone call, he said, look, you know. Uh, I love Brian, and he goes, you know, I'd love to see this film get made. So he made the mistake of saying, I'll do anything I can do to, if there's anything I can do to help, just let me know. Yeah. And I was like, that was the opening I needed. And I said, well, I've got this crazy idea. <laughs> it's like, why don't we put you on camera and uh, let's rig up a car <laughs> with yeah. cameras and let's have you and Brian drive around L.A. and visit the places that, that meant the most to Brian in his life. And, uh, and he said, okay, let's, let's give it a try. And, uh, and that, that's the film we made. Yeah. And did that, I mean, you've obviously the biggest challenge is interviewing and that's partly what the, there's many themes in this movie. And one of the themes is how trying to go, going about interviewing Brian Wilson, but, uh, it's, um, I mean, besides that challenge, I mean, what is, I, mean, I imagine it's not the easiest thing to, to make a doc based on just putting cameras in a car and, and, uh, and letting them roll. I mean, uh, you, you had no idea what you were getting, did you? Absolutely. I had, I had no clue at all. And it's all very, um, you know, Brian's very random in the way he thinks. He's not, uh, he doesn't think in a linear fashion. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, so he's not going to start at the beginning of his life and, you know, take us up through and, and as Jason predicted, there were long stretches where Brian wouldn't say anything. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, so we ended up with 70 hours of, of footage of them in the car. Wow. And um, uh, one of the things that I didn't want to do is I didn't want to, I didn't want to infer anything on Brian as far as an agenda, as far as mm. what we wanted to talk about. If Brian wanted to talk about something, we talked about it. If he didn't, we didn't. Um, I didn't want to tell him to wear the same clothes to match continuity. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to say, you know, come on the radio from the, we had a follow vehicle. I didn't want to come on the radio and say, Hey Jason, you know, when he was answering that question before we were stopped, now we're moving. Can you ask him again? I didn't want to yeah. do any of that stuff, yeah. which when we got into the edit bay made it a nightmare. Um, right. Right. not only just, not only to make that work, but just to find the story and to find mm -hmm. the thread. And what I discovered was with our editor, Hector Lopez, um, we spent nine months editing the film, is that it, it became um, a, 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 an, an emotional journey. And that was the moments we were looking for. Mm. Those were the moments that were, if Brian revealed himself in any way, if Brian was emotional in any mm. way, or mm. um, offered any kind of clarity on something in any way, those were the moments that we were going to use and we were just going to try to forego and forget about a, 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 a traditional narrative structure, you know, a traditional three act structure, which is what I believe in as a filmmaker. Um, we were just going to forego that and hope that that emotional thread will pull us all the way through to the end of the film. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I was saying, I think at the beginning, I was so nervous about how the film would be received because it's not a traditionally told film and it's not a traditionally structured film. Um, and so I was just hopeful that people would want to come along for that emotional journey. And I, I gotta say, Brian opened up in ways that I never imagined, but falling in that vehicle, yeah, I had my doubts every day. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. And I guess, I mean, you're talking about someone who's been, uh, uh, tearing up structures and doing things his own way for his whole life, you might as well, the doc might as well be as well. That's um, a great point, Matthew. I never yeah. thought about that. You're right. There's His songs have never, uh, yeah, they don't follow traditional structures either, do they? I mean, you've got pop royalty on there talking about it and, you know, how he just threw everything, all the rules out the window and yeah. made the Very new cool. rules for the rest, everyone who came behind. Um, I mean, let's talk a little bit more about those, those I mean, okay, so people, it's not driving Miss Daisy necessarily. It's not, uh, you know, we're not just, uh, it's, it's, it's a little, it's, it's much more, uh, exciting is not the word. It's certainly much more poignant than it sounds like two guys just driving around in a car. I mean, this is, um, 
you, what you capture is is quite amazing. You you've talked about the intimacy. You've got this, but you've there's this is where all the themes start coming out. You've got this friendship that he has with uh, Jason. So it's a buddy movie. It's a road picture in a way. It's uh, it goes into the heartbreaks, the highs and lows of life. <laughs> That one reviewer that who's uh, we will not give any uh, a mention to, but uh, talked about monosyllabic answers. But he says like a thousand words with his face. It's amazing, you know. Thank you. That's, that was one of the things that I was um, I, I was hoping the audiences would see because I was mm-hmm. seeing it. You know, I yeah. saw where if we just sat on his face, I I saw the emotions, I saw yeah. the answers yeah. in his eyes and in his face and. And you just take it on faith that, that the audience will as well. But I, I think you're right, Matthew. I think, you know, he says so much with his eyes and he says so much with, with his face that it, you know, the answers can be, you know, monosyllabic or short, but there is so much in them when he mm-hmm. says them um, yeah. and when yeah. you, you see him saying them and in the context of what they're talking about. You know, when he talks about his brothers passing away yeah. and he just says, I love them. You know, when he talks about Dennis passing away and he says, I really love him. That, that may only be three or four words, but my God, it just rips your gut out when he says it and the way he says it and the, the emotion on his face, because you can see the hurt and you can see the pain. Mm. And I think you can tell that. He's never said that to his brother. You know, he never yeah. got a chance to say to Carl and Dennis, I love you. And, or you're a great producer. And mm-hmm. to hear him say, you know, I miss them. You know, it may be three words, but for me, it, it, it was, it was heartbreaking to, to see yeah. him say those three words. And plenty of us can wax poetic till the cows come home and not say anything. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a great one. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. He says more with three words and three notes then, uh, yeah, most people can well, say. Yeah. indeed. I mean, getting back to this, I mean, so, you know, this, uh, as you talked about, is uh, a famously difficult uh, uh, interview, um, uh, and uh, at least how others have tried interviewing him. Um, but, you know, he's, let's talk about what he's, he's battling and dealing with. Um, you know, uh, I know. I guess it's pretty well known, but I think for some reason I wasn't quite aware it's how much uh, how much his mental health has really defined him, and yes. uh, he's literally battling demons. What is what is Brian Wilson? He's got this what schizoaffective disorder. So what what does that mean yeah. in practice, and how does that affect his day to day? Yeah, no, that's a, it's a great point, Matthew. It's it's it, and that's one of the points I wanted to make in the film is that. I, I wanted people to understand that this is a daily battle for Brian Wilson, Mm -hmm. right? This is not something that goes away. It's not something that's, you know, you take a pill and you're, it's solved or Mm -hmm. it flares up or or anything like this. It's a daily battle for Brian Wilson. And he does, he has a schizoaffective disorder where he hears voices um, in his head. And uh, those voices are always saying, you know, evil things, bad things. Brian, we're going to murder you. I'm going to kill you. Brian, this is the devil. Um, I'm taking you to hell. Just horrible things. These are the voices that he hears in his head. And, um, and he deals with that every single day and has, you know, for, for most of, well, his entire adult life. Yeah. And maybe even before, we're not sure. And stuff doctors aren't sure quite when it, when it, when it came effect for him, but yeah. it is a, it is a daily battle for him. And, um, he has his good days and he has his bad days. Um, you know, I've, I've witnessed the bad days. I've witnessed the good days. Um, you know, his wife has, has told me, Melinda, she said that, you know, when he stares off into the corners, is usually when he's hearing the voices. Um, you know, he'll start to kind of look away and, and look up into the, almost in the corners of his head. And, and that's when he's hearing the voices. And it's... You know, the medications that he's on, he's, you know, of course, he, you know, he suffers from depression and uh, seasonal affective disorder. He suffers from that. Um, you know, so the winters are really tough for Brian. Um, so it, it's just a daily, daily battle. And those medications that he's on, you know, those medications have to be monitored 
constantly and they have to be tweaked you know if yeah, yeah. you on them too long then they become less effective you make a change and it has a side effect and it's um it, it's a it's a miracle and, and i think taylor hawkins says that from the food fire yep. which is you know taylor hawkins is this crazy rock and roll drummer with his long <laughs> hair and you know he's just the guy you want to have at a party right right exactly and, but he is just one of the most insightful guys in the world and, and he says in the film, he goes, you know, it's really a miracle that he's here and a miracle that he's outperforming. And, and it is. And it, mm. the, the miracle is Brian's courage, you know, the, mm. the courage that Brian Wilson has every day to get out of bed and function at the level that he functions. It's truly a miracle. And yeah. um, I, I hope fans come away with that. I hope fans can witness and see just a tiny sample of what it's like to walk in Brian's shoes for just – you know, just for an hour and a half. Yeah. I think that, that Taylor, well, Taylor, you have a lot of great interviews in the, in the uh, doc, but uh, I think it's also Taylor Hawkins, this gonzo drummer, if you will, who, uh, who's even the one that says, well, you know, creative types are often most sensitive and more susceptible to drugs and things like that. You know, it's, uh, that came from Taylor, you know, and uh, I think that that got to a point. I mean, there's one thing that struck me, there's like, any, any when you become Brian Wilson or you, any of these figures like this, and we've had other docs that talk about people who have become, they almost become our vision of them, our view of them is is shaped by however they've been covered in the media all these years, and so and I think one thing that comes out and that's to to follow on with what Taylor says is that uh, you have this whole section uh, of the doc that talks about you know how he is such not just a courageous per, uh, person but he he just exudes fortitude. To have yes. gone through everything he's been through, and to this day still plugging away, um, you know it's it's quite it's it's quite amazing. It really is, and he and he doesn't have to, you yep. know. Um, you know, Brian is very safe in his legacy. He doesn't need the money, you know. Um, he you know he doesn't he doesn't have to go out there, but he mm-hmm. wants to go out there, and he he finds the he finds I think life. In, in living and he, he finds life and continuing and he's, he's the last Wilson, right? You know, his mother, his parents are gone. His two younger brothers are gone. You know, his uncles and aunts are all gone. He's the last Wilson of, of his generation. And I, you know, just my interpretation, but I, I think he takes, he sees a responsibility to keep going and he, he mm-hmm. sees a responsibility to continue. And, uh, and I do, I, I, I find strength in Brian's story. Um, I, 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 I think to myself, if I'm having a bad day, it's like, you know, well, what would Brian do? You know, he'd get out of bed. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Know? And we talked to a lot of fans. I interviewed a lot of fans. Unfortunately, they didn't make the film. Um, there's so many of these things when you do these docs, you're just trying to right. figure out what the movie is. And yeah. we did interview a lot of amazing fans. And, and that was a really common theme, I think, with fans that were, there were people that loved the music, but there were people that I think really also identified with Brian's story. Mm. And, 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 and Brian's story is a mental health story. Yeah. And uh, there, uh, there's a lot of fans out there that said those kind of those same things that, you know, if Brian Wilson can get out there and perform, then you know what? I can get up and go to my job today. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and that's an incredible, incredible uh, tribute to, to Brian Wilson's life. Mm. And from what I could tell you, it's not like he goes on about it. He doesn't like, he doesn't wear it on his sleeve or anything. It's just like, you just, you got to get on with things. Yes. Yeah. 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 He just yeah. deals with it. He faces those fears and he, yeah. he just will sit quietly and think about it and, and then go in and do it. You know? Yeah. I think that takes us, uh, that's a good point for us to give our listeners a break. Uh, we'll be right back with uh, Brent Wilson, the director, co-producer and writer of Brian Wilson, Long Promised Road premiered at Tribeca Film Festival in June of last year, and now has already been out on theatrical release in the U.S. uh, late last year and early this one here in the U.K., and it's on demand on various streaming services. If you enjoy Factual America, check out the Movie Maker podcast. That's all one word, Movie Maker, where our friends at moviemaker.com interview everyone from filmmakers just breaking in to A-listers like David Fincher and Edgar Wright. 
about their movie-making secrets and behind-the-scenes tricks of the trade. They go deep and let the guests speak uninterrupted to get you the most film insight. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with award-winning filmmaker Brent Wilson, the director of Brian Wilson, Long Promised Road. It's already been out on theatrical release in the U.S. uh, late last year and also here in the U.K. in January. And you can find it on demand on various streaming services. Uh, we were talking about uh, what uh, Brian has to go through is is day to day battles. Um, I mean, it may seem like the obvious, but uh, is is music a release form? And the reason I ask it is that uh, it seems you know he doesn't seem to battle it as much on stage. You know, is that how is that his way of communicating? He's not the he's never been the most communicative person as we know, but he, he there's something about we kind of talked about that scene already. It's in my head. It goes to the fingers. It goes out the speaker. But that is the way he talks to us, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think it is that simple for him, right? Um, and then just kind of watching Brian, you know, and spending so much time with him and, and getting to know him, you know, my analogy kind of came to be, I think music is to Brian what oxygen is to me. You know, mm. I have to have it. You know I mean? I, you know, without oxygen, I'm not breathing and I'm not living. And I, I just think it's that important to Brian. And, um, you know, when he's in the car, you know, the radio is on. You know, when he's at home, the radio is on. Um, when he's backstage at the concerts, um, you know, Brian is always the first to arrive. Right? He loves to be on the road. Um, he, you know, he'll show up two hours before sound check. And, you know, he sets in a big chair beside the stage he doesn't go to his dressing room mm. he sits in a big leather chair which you see some you see little yeah. clips of it in the film and he sits in this big leather chair beside the stage just right behind the curtain and um and he listens to music and he watches the band set up and he watches the crew and and he's listening to music and you go to a brian wilson show there's a walk-in music you know it's it's uh it, it, so it's just always there with him and i do i think it's just oxygen for him yeah I mean, speaking of which, I mean, you know, if we think about what the prevailing narrative is about Brian Wilson, you know, obviously we know the Beach Boys, California Sound, which you do, you know, obviously have a touch on, and then Pet Sounds, the seminal album, the album that is considered one of the best of all times. But it strikes me in watching your film that uh, he's more of a genius than we realize. Um, I think it was Don Was that compares him with Mo- Mozart. And it it strikes, you know, and there's a scene where he keeps talking about he wants to make a rock album, and I'm thinking he's made loads of rock albums, but <laughs> but he's but but he uh, he's more Mozart and Gershwin than he is rock in some ways. Yeah, yeah, no, it's so funny because I kept, you know, I was thinking the same thing. It's like he keeps talking about wanting to make a rock album. I'm like, my God, Brian, you you know, you, you define the rock album. Rock. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> I never quite understood that either. Um, but you know, uh, you know, Brian's always been just a little, going back to that just a little bit, you know, Brian is really self-conscious about his music. Um, mm-hmm. you know, cause he grew up obviously, with, you know, with an abusive father yeah. and he, he grew up playing sports and he grew up with two brothers. You know, I grew up with my brother and it's a miracle we didn't kill each other. And I just had one brother. Um, <laughs> so two brothers, I'm sure one of us would have died. Um, so Brian really grew up, and then he also grew up in the fifties in a very rough and tumble time when men were men, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I, you know, I think Brian's really self-conscious of sometimes how soft his music is, and it's not mm-hmm. like rock and roll, right. and he's really self-conscious of that, um, and that almost ashamed, I think, of this mm-hmm. these feelings that he, you know, that he evokes. Right, these emotions that he evokes are so soft and so gentle. Mm. Mm. Uh, I think there's a shame that probably stems from his father. You know that yeah. you know men don't say "I love you" and men don't express their emotions and yeah. you know have a drink and go about your day. Yeah. And um, so I do. I think it's it's fascinating that he you know he you know he was always very self conscious of his falsetto as well. Like you know. Mm. Guys didn't want him, you know, he, they always wanted him to sing falsetto when he wouldn't, he didn't want to sing falsetto because it wasn't manly. But anyway, to back, back to your point. So I think that's, that is certainly a part of it. And I, I treated Brian, I, I agree. I, I think Brian is 
an artist of a Mozart, uh, of a Picasso, of a Monet, of a Hemingway. And as crazy as it sounds or as arrogant as it sounds, I treated the film that way. You know, I thought to myself, how valuable would 70 hours of interviews be of Monet, with Monet, or 70 hours with Ernest Hemingway of audio recordings? Or how, how valuable would that be? And I'm not talking, you know, financially, but just how valuable yeah. would that be to the world to have Monet talking for 70 hours about his music? And that's the way I approach the film is because um, I, I think Brian is on that level of an artist. And, and obviously, so does Elton John and Bruce Springsteen and, and a few others. So I feel like I'm in pretty good company and, and feeling that way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think you are. And, and I think in terms of, uh, I mean, f f one thing I want to say, I've got three boys. I cannot imagine them. Uh, that's one thing that struck me. He talks about three boys, you know, they sat in the back seat and they would harmonize. I mean, I, I, there's no way I'd ever get my sons to do something like that. I mean, maybe I don't threaten them enough like uh, his dad did. I, I don't know. <laughs> but I don't give him a whack on the side of the head or anything. But, uh, um, but you know, this, this thing, you know, um, I think probably, I mean, would it be unfair to say that in some people's minds that... Um, um, that you know his creative genius was all in his youth, and it was in the '60s, and that's uh, and believe me, that's a catalog anyone could rest the rest their rest of their uh, lives on. But uh, um, he is a creative whirlwind to this day, and that's something else you you show it. You show him in the studio. He is still this stickler for perfection. Um, how many times they had to keep playing those first a couple bars there because. They weren't doing it just exactly right. Um, and it struck me as something you said. We had you on before for Streetlight Harmonies, and that was this uh, the doo-wop doo doc that you did. And I asked you about what separates those artists from contemporary artists, and you said, well, how many of our contemporary artists are going to be working into their 70s? Well, here we are. Here you've got another one. You've got yeah. Brian Wilson. And um, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've I listened to Pet Sounds again yesterday. I've listened to it before. I'm not the... I'm not the biggest fan of of pet sounds but i listened to smile i had never listened to smile before i was blown away you know that wow. is and and i can see why that shows up on people's top however now we got to go now 400 500 albums or 100 yeah. whatever it is but it's on there uh, an album you should listen to before you die that kind of stuff um he is still i mean and i guess it's that mind that's the the, the creative the, the mind that's also Got all the demons. Also has is is just a mind that probably none of us could even fathom or imagine what's playing around in that head of his. And it, it was important for me to to try to capture that. That was one of my goals. Was I wanted to see Brian Wilson in his element, and I wanted to discover if if it was there like that. I mean, and we do use some new tracks. You know, there's a beautiful song that Brian uses called Southern California. That's a stunning track that was on his Lucky Old Son album. Another song called Midnight's Another Day that I would encourage people to listen to that, that are just stunning works that, you know, Brian's done in the last, you know, 10, 12 years that, that are just amazing, amazing work. Particularly that Lucky Old Son album is, is really stunning. But I wanted to try as a fan and as a filmmaker, I wanted to see Brian in the studio and I wanted to see what that process is like. And that scene you're talking about, we go into the studio and that scene that you see, that's happening pretty much in real time. I did very, very little trimming down mm -hmm. of that scene. And so he, he goes in, he's, he's nervous. I didn't know that. I didn't know how nervous he was because I was at the studio when Jason and Brian pulled up and he has that moment in the parking lot where he tells Jason that he's scared. Yeah. Um, and is just a daily part of Brian Wilson's life. And here is Brian going into the studio for the one millionth time, you know, with a band that he's been with on the road for a thousand shows to his favorite studio with his engineers and he's still scared, right? Mm -hmm. That speaks volumes, I thought, to what it's like to be Brian Wilson for a day. Because here he is doing what he's done his whole life and, and he's still scared. But he says, you know, I'm going to go in and he goes in and he goes in, Matthew, and he sits down at that piano and he starts to work on that song, Honeycomb. Yeah. And it's just uh, incredible to watch. 
and he just starts to dish out those parts and correct them and he hears it in his head and he's just trying to explain it to him and correct them and it was incredible to watch and I was standing there I was behind the camera operator and I was kind of taking all that in and, and I thought to myself, my God, this is exactly what it was like in 1964 when he was doing God Only Knows. That he didn't, yeah. He's not doing it any differently. Mm. And here he is at 77 years old, 78, whatever it was when we, when we shot that. And he's still doing that exact same thing. And it was just inspiring to watch. And I started to tear up. You know, I started, mm. I started to, so I did that, you know, that manly thing we were talking about where you don't want to let, you know, guys don't cry <laughs> kind of thing. So I kind of did one of these, you know, where you yeah, turn your head yeah, and go, you know, yeah. like, well, don't let anybody see you. You know, like you're rubbing yeah, your eye. You don't want yeah. to see them wipe away the tears. And as I did that, I looked over and I saw three other people crying. <laughs> there was Jason Fine was tearing up. David Calcano, our graphics designer, yeah. art director. David was crying. And a couple of minutes later, he left the studio. And that, that afternoon that night when we done i said dude i can't believe you left the studio right in the middle of that moment and he goes brent i was crying so hard i thought i was going to destroy the take i thought i was going to ruin the take yeah. so we all knew as fans we were witnessing something it's it's a miracle it really just is it's an incredible to watch so i, I you know just to see brian work on that song that was worth the price of admission right there <laughs> Yeah, I think, and and is there? I mean, there's a soundtrack that comes out with this. Yes, there yeah, out. there's a soundtrack that's out, and Honeycomb is on there, and uh, all the other songs Brian recorded um, for that session. And what we did was, I I wanted to have Brian record as he did in '64. A lot of recording nowadays, you know, it's all obviously on Pro Tools. And they generally yeah. record, you know, one instrument at a time. You know, they right. have the drummer record. If you want a French horn or a saxophone, you pull it down off the computer and all of that. And artists are never in the room anymore. And I find that really sad. I understand having been, being a producer on this film, I understand why they do it that way. It's very expensive to have that yeah. big room and to have, you know, I think Brian's band is 10 guys, 12 guys, have 10, 12 guys at one time in hotels all recording at once very very expensive mm. and but i wanted to record that and our producers were were kind enough to, to to indulge me on that and i i thought to myself i just want to see what that's like i want to see what that energy is and i think i think we capture that i think we see brian you know doing that and so we released we put out a soundtrack we didn't plan to put out a soundtrack but i was like look it'd be crazy not to release these <laughs> You know, yeah. six songs that Brian recorded over those three or four days um, out, and uh, so those, yeah, those those songs are out on the soundtrack now, along with some unreleased songs that that are in the film, and then the new song "Right Where I Belong" that he did with Jim James, of "My Morning Jacket." That we made the Oscar shortlist on. We didn't, we didn't, uh, we didn't make the Oscar nomination, but uh, but Brian did go to the Oscar shortlist, so he was on the final twelve songs. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So we made, uh, yeah, we made the cut from one thirty to twelve, and, okay. uh, and then last week they had the Oscar nominations oh. come out, and uh, and we didn't we didn't make the top five, but it's still a remarkable song that Jim and Brian did. I'm, I'm really indeed. proud of that collaboration. And indeed, and I found out something new. I uh, Jim and I uh, share the same birthday. He's a, is that right? Yeah, he's oh. a, in April. He's a few years younger than me, but uh, he's a uh, but yeah, um, doing their little. You know, we spare no expense here at El, uh, Factual America with our research. Uh, but yeah, doing doing the Google search, I discovered there's not many people who have my birthday, but he's one of them. Um, uh, you got to take those, right? You got to take them when you can get them, right? Yeah, it's exactly, like <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, well, congratulations on that, and congratulations on on what I you know I highly recommend. Um, I mean, I say. Uh, yeah, we all, all our most of the films we have on here, almost all. I have to say, all the films we have on here are, are are great and worth a watch. But I do highly recommend this one. I I I I found it extremely poignant. Um, and that says someone who's uh, I appreciate. I've always appreciated what uh, Brian Wilson's done in the Beach Boys, but I was I wouldn't necessarily just have described myself as a, a a fan or a huge fan of theirs. And there's you know these you know generational issues and you know because brian's the exact same age as my mom practically but uh exactly. but the thing is but but i but you know i you know i have a much better appreciation for him and what he's going through and what he has gone through and also just sort of 
it's it's kind of like almost the meaning of life you know this watching this film kind of uh that's this is life it's it's ups and downs and we see it through the eyes and of of in the sounds of of brian wilson so uh, that's beautiful thank you thank you for that well and well the caffeine's finally kicked in i think uh (laughs) um how do you follow up this magnum opus uh you gonna make another music doc I'd love to make another music doc. Jason and I, I, I love working with Jason. And so we're, we're talking about a few projects that uh, we're trying to get off the ground. And then um, I've got a project coming out later this summer. Um, it's a completely different world. It's in the sports world. And you know, maybe we can mm-hmm. come back and talk to you about that at some point. Um, okay. I think they're going to announce it here hopefully in the next week or two. But um, it's Excellent. a completely different uh, kind of project. But it's a, a, an epic sports film, sports documentary. And, um, and then, yeah, I would love to, to, to continue to work with Jason and, and, uh, and explore these, these artists because, I, you know, they, they do relive remarkable lives and, yeah. and they, do, um, they do give us so much joy. I think that's one of the things that I love about yeah. making the music documentaries or at least my approach to documentaries because I also did this with Street Light Harmonies and I did yeah. it with the current doc and I did it with a documentary that I did on World War II veterans. It's that you want to return the favor. Right. right. You know, Brian Wilson has given me so much joy yeah. and so much love um, in my own life. You know, I want to be able to return that favor in just some small, tiny way. And, and that's the way I, I, I try to approach my films. Yeah, I think. Um, well, first of all, I do hope you make another one with Jason, uh, <laughs> though. I don't know who you're going to because he's got some great articles over the years. Uh, but they're usually now, unfortunately, with people who've now passed away. So, so uh, you're not going to get Merle Haggard back. You're not going to get Johnny Cash. So I don't know, uh, but uh, I know you probably can't say who who might be in the works. But uh, I do hope you do because I thought that was a uh, he. He certainly. Uh, I can't imagine yeah. anyone I, else. I can't mention him just purely for not jinxing him. I just don't want to jinx him. That's, yeah, that's exactly. always the whole trick. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's exactly. not a secretive thing. It's just you just don't want to jinx it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I, I perfectly understand, which is why I'm not going to press you on which sport, what, to, you know, <laughs> is it basketball? Is it baseball? What are we talking <laughs> here? Um, but we look forward to that um, and we'd love to have you on and uh, make it a three-peat. Uh, yeah, we all come at this and yeah, maybe we'll all get back into a theater and, uh, yeah, go, go see some movies, right? <laughs> you know, maybe I'll come to the States. We can actually do this face-to-face. Wouldn't that be amazing? That'd be <laughs> fantastic. I'd love to, yeah, yeah. Come to L.A. and, yeah, yeah beer's on me. Well, that you see, uh, you, that's your mistake. That's like Jason saying, doing whatever... You, you let me know whatever you need. I, I'll help you out. Uh, yes, you know, exactly. once, you, once you offer me a beer, I'm, I'm probably coming. Um, all right. Well, I just want to thank uh, Brent Wilson again um, for coming on. He's director of Brian Wilson, Long Promised Road. Out um, on, well, just look for it. Google it. It's out on various uh, streaming services, and it may still be in a theater or cinema near you. Thanks again. Thank you, Matthew. It's a wonderful program, and I'm going to keep listening. Man, well, I appreciate that. Up. I think if, if you, I mean, I mean this, uh, I didn't give you the feedback that I, you solicited. I didn't ever get my teenagers to watch uh, this movie, but you didn't need their feedback. Uh, the thing is, uh, if you ever have anything else you or suggestions or things you think we could do differently, let us, let us know. Um, yeah, no, you have great taste. I mean, all of your films. Uh, you know, which one I really enjoyed, too, was, um, oh, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the writer's name. Well, it was on the playwright from Texas. Oh, um, Horton Foot. Yes, Horton Foot. That was beautiful, lovely. It's, and and yeah. you, as you can appreciate, that is um, Anne Anne Rapp who did the uh, film. I mean, she no film background at all. None. Yeah. I mean, yeah. well, she was a she, film in that she was in the industry, but she you know she was not a director or, or not a director. She's like a script supervisor, right? Script supervisor. Yes. Uh, yeah. f- for a lot of famous directors and yes. Tender Mercies and others. Yes. And she decided, and it's, a, again, you talk about these being uh, uh, passion, passion projects. Passion project. yes. I mean, that yeah, one yeah. was a, because what did, how long did this one last for you? Was this take about five, five six, years? Yeah, five yeah, years. yeah, five years. Yeah, yeah. Hers was over 10 years. Yeah. She did. No, I drew so much inspiration from her story. It was, it was lovely to hear that, to hear her story. Yeah. And, and that I really you, enjoyed that one. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that because I think we put that as one of our favorites uh, for that year, and I think it also was, um, 
Yeah, I think it shows you, you know, it doesn't have to be a big name celeb. It doesn't Absolutely. have to, you yeah. know, I mean, he's he's known in his circles, but, uh, you know, it can be about a, I think he was about 90 years old at the time, um, yeah. and you can follow him around and you can make a lovely film out of it that exactly. resonates with people. It doesn't people. have to be, yeah, a $3 million documentary, <laughs> you know, with Ron Howard as the director or Peter yep. Jackson, yep. you know, you don't. You know, you don't. It doesn't have to be that. And I, I thought it was just a wonderful film and a wonderful her story for telling that film and how she got it. And it was just wonderful. It was it was really inspiring. And I think you're 100 percent right. I hope people who follow docs and want to be doc filmmakers. I hope they hold the, heard that episode because yeah. that's that's what they should be doing. Yeah. Not you know not trying to do the next get back. You yeah. know that's yeah. not going to happen anymore. You know. You know, doing the get back is, you know, like about akin now to directing the next Star Wars movie. You know, exactly. it's, you know, it's a, there's one or two guys are going to do those films, right? And right. the rest is going to have to be done in a, in a very, in a, in a manner in which she did it. And it was a lovely story, really lovely. I mean, since we're on this track and uh, and the camera's still rolling, proverbially, I, I think. Uh, what were the struggle? I mean, you must have struggled selling this to people. I mean, in terms of, you know, what? Well, I've got two guys in a car driving around for. <laughs> we've got seventy hours of film. Let's, no. you know, it was, it was, it was, it was a really, um, it was a very frustrating time because you're right. We had a different, very different kind of film. Even though we have Bruce Springsteen, you know, Elton Indeed. John, you know, Taylor Hawkins and the Foo Fighters, Nick Jonas. Yep. Uh, you know, from the Jonas Brothers, you know, Nick Jonas has 40 million Instagram followers, right? If he put up a movie of him clipping his toenails, mm -hmm. it's going to be the highest rated film of the day, right? right? And but yet still, you know, we at the heart of it, it was this very intimate and personal film with these guys in a car. And, and it was difficult to try to get um, people to understand that I think and believe audiences are going to respond to this. Mm -hmm. Um, because it wasn't traditional, and so it was. It was it was a tough path, and then of course, it, probably the biggest factor was COVID. You know, we mm -hmm. were set to premiere at Tribeca um, uh, in 2019, and Tribeca was going to be in April, I think, March or April, and we were two weeks away. I was out buying a new suit, and uh, I got the phone call that Tribeca had been canceled. Yeah. And, um, you know, nobody knew what was going to happen, what was going to happen, how it was going to happen, how long this was going to happen. And what we discovered, Matthew, was that um, a lot of buyers tried to really take advantage of filmmakers during that time, or independent filmmakers at mm -hmm. that time, mm -hmm. where they were going to lowball them and say, okay, they're setting on this content, they're panicked, you know, we're not panicked, so we're going to buy low. And so we got a lot of really low, shitty offers that um you know that you know i would rather you know yeah. you know we don't need to talk about who they were but there was yeah they thought you know we're gonna go by coming to america too you know yeah. we're gonna go by greyhound the tom mm -hmm. hanks film we're gonna go by all of these big films and we're gonna spend hundreds of millions of dollars on them yeah but these independent filmmakers are gonna offer them pennies on the dollar because they're panicked and um, so there, that went on for quite a while, and um, it was an unfortunate, unfortunate time for independent filmmakers. And, but we were, we were fortunate in that our producers, uh, Tim Heddington, uh, Teresa Page, um, we were in a position where they didn't have to take those offers. And uh, right. we could kind of wait this out and wait for theatrical to come back around and wait for, you know, we could just wait this out. And, uh, and we did. We were really happy with our partners and to both domestically and internationally and, and we feel really fortunate but i know as a documentary filmmaker it was a frustrating time um because because of the situation that, that COVID brought um yeah. so hopefully we're out of that and we're through that now and we'll get back to a little bit of normalcy yeah. and we can get back to some in-person festivals yeah you know get back to people that was the other thing that was really frustrating we turned down a lot of festivals because we didn't want to do in-person you know, I just didn't feel like the film, I just don't think the film should have been seen on a laptop. Yep. You know, I wanted it to have the opportunity to be seen uh, in a theater and heard in a theater. Mm -hmm. And um, and I just didn't want somebody watching it on their phone and hearing God only knows broken down and multi-tracks yeah. on, on an iPhone or an iPad. 
Um, so we were fortunate. We, we turned down a lot of the in-person festivals and we were able to wait for Tribeca to do their in-person. They did outdoors mm-hmm. and they were, they were wonderful. And then we did Nashville at that point, which was opening back up. And then, yeah, then we were able to, to make, have our partners and release it domestic and internationally in theaters yes. where it could be heard and seen. Yes. And I guess we should give a shout out to Universal, obviously. And, and uh, and also yeah. um, say, th- yeah, that's that's great. I'm so glad that worked out for you. And I must say, what strikes me is a independent filmmakers, hope always springs eternal. That whole period you were talking about, the number of people were saying, look, they're going to be starved for content, so they're going to pay us even, it's going to even be better. But in, yeah. it, it was the exact opposite. It you was know. the exact opposite. Yeah. Yeah. They were, yeah. yeah, they were the veterans. They yes. were the experts. And they knew that, yeah, yeah, we were going to be panicked and we were sitting on it and like, oh my God, we've got to get this out. And yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was eye opening. It, yeah, it, yeah. it was really very frustrating, very eye opening, uh, okay. very eye opening time. Well, glad it worked out for you in the end. Absolutely. And, and it worked out for all of us who get to see this. And uh, thank Absolutely. you so much. And uh, yes, anytime. Love to have you back. Look forward to. Whatever the next doc is, whether it's that sports one that you can't talk about or that music one you can't talk about, either one. Um, <laughs> Brent, good luck and uh, thanks again, and we'll uh, hopefully see you sooner than another, you know, than a year and a half. And I'm absolutely. I'd love to be the first three P. Yeah, that's that's my goal now. There I'd you go. Three P. So see, now. that's that's what's on your wall on your whiteboard. That's right. It's <laughs> on my dream board now. What a three P. <laughs> okay. All right. Take care. Thank you, Brent. Thank you, Matthew. Take okay. care. You too. Yes, I just want to thank again award-winning filmmaker Brent Wilson, uh, the director of Brian Wilson, Long Promised Road. Had a theatrical release in November in the U.S. and in January here in the U.K. and worldwide and is now on demand on various streaming services. So, uh, Brent, thanks again for, for coming on to Factual America again. I'd like to give a shout out to Sam and Joe Graves at Intersound Audio in Eskrick, England in deepest, darkest Yorkshire. A big thanks to Nevin Apanovich, podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who ensures we continue getting great guests onto the show. And finally, a big thanks to our listeners. As always, we love to hear from you, so please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas. You can reach out to us on YouTube, social media, or directly by going to our website, www.factualamerica.com and clicking on the Get In Touch link. And as always, please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Almo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.